Welcome to Music of Sundry Pines. I bet half of you are here just to find out what the heck sundry means. It means assorted or various. It comes from a collection uh, published by a man named Thomas Ford. Um, and we're not playing any of this stuff tonight right? because I've got confused with birds, songs of sundry natures. So and we're doing a lot of bird. But I've got the Ford out there in the foyer, in the narthex, to use the language. And you can take a look at some of the original um, uh, facsimil facsimiles of the original music, some of it that we're playing tonight. We're going to start with a piece by the most famous Anthony Holborn, about whom we know very little except that he wrote a lot of music. And John Dowland, who we're going to be singing a lot of tonight, dedicated uh, the first song in his second book of uh, Songs and Airs to the most famous Anthony Holborn. And we have that one out there for you to see too. We're starting the dance. It's called All Name. The honeysuckle. Music by uh, one of the great madrigalists of the English Renaissance named Thomas Wilkes. Thomas Wilkes was an interesting guy. He uh, was organist at Chichester Cathedral, but he got fired for being a notorious drunkard and for swearing and blaspheming all the time. They actually kept records of that, and he has written some of the most sublime music. We'll start with a piece called all at once well met, fair ladies. Oh, no, 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 no,
interweaving voices, they call that polyphony or counterpoint, to John Dowland, actually John Doland. It looks like Dowland. How do we know it's Doland? Well, because he wrote all this really depressing music, and they knew it at the time. And there's even a piece that's called Semper Doland, Semper Dolans, which means it's, uh, it's still that John Dowland, and it's still sad. And so... <laughs> That's how we know, because it rhymes with Doland and Dolans. So we're going to do uh, the first two pieces from his first book of Songs and Airs, which was a huge hit, had four reprintings. This is around 1597. That was huge in that day. They're wonderful pieces, and uh, we're going to be doing several of those tonight. Unquiet Thoughts and Whoever Thinks.
the reporters. We're coming now to um, a couple of pieces by the man who really got the matter going in England. His name was Thomas Morley. He wrote a book called A Plain and Easy Introduction to Practical Music, which is neither plain nor easy. I bought it. They went, oh my gosh. Um, but he was a really big name. He inspired Wilkes and the people who came after him. He did a lot with bringing the Italian madrigals across the Alps, Musica Transalpina, and you have a lot of the fa laws and things like that. We're doing two contrasting pieces, first for the solo quartet, uh, one that many people know, April is in my mistress' face, and then we're going to one of the big ones, Firefighter. of fire coming up a lot of times tonight. It was not intentional, but I just started noticing all of these things about the fire. And here, it's we're, let's put the fire out. Fire, fire. It actually reminds me of a song from Gilbert and Sullivan's Iolanthe, but I don't think that Morley had heard that yet. <laughs>
from 1608. We, we started with uh, all at once, well met fair ladies, a five part madrigal. These were a little bit lighter, lighter texts, and in three parts. They would have had part books for them. And again, we have the actual part books for these two pieces, um, and uh, one coming up a little bit later out in the narthex. So I hope you do get a chance to take a look at those. This first one, four hearts, two necks, one reading. <clears throat> size interchangeably. What was happening? The top and the second part were interchanging. They were going back and forth, doing exactly what the words were saying. We'll really hear that later. The second one from the same collection, The Nightingale. Completely different sound.
the viola da gamba. It was the most popular consort instrument um, in England during the, this period. It is a little bit like a guitar, a little bit like a cello. It has six strings and frets, but it's played bowed. It was used as an accompaniment for voices all the time. And we will see that in the second of the two pieces that we do. Um, it has different sizes. We have three of them here. The treble, and, which is the small one, the tenor, and the bass. We have a special one here. Penny has um, a slightly later instrument, the seven string bass, which would have been used uh, a little bit later in the Baroque period. But we're gonna feature them in uh, the first dance. It's called the Pavan Dominataire. 
Again, French by Gervais, but it means English pavane. Pavane is a stately dance. That will be followed by one of the iconic pieces from the period, The Silver Swan, um, sung by Jody Lee. to listen to the only sacred pieces on the program tonight by William Byrd, arguably the greatest composer from the English Renaissance. Wrote a lot of things. He crossed over from the Catholic times into the Protestant times. He really was a Catholic and that's where his sympathies lie. And he got in trouble for that. We are going to do the first one from his Mass for Three Voices, the Latin Mass. And it's the Kyrie 
It is the shortest Kyrie you've ever heard. It's, you can tell it's really liturgical. And then we're going to go directly into one of the Protestant pieces in six parts with extremely complex um, counterpoint call from the Psalms. Praise our Lord, all you Gentiles.
from the first book, Rest a While, You Cruel Cares. see in the, uh, the end of the verse, it talks about Laura, fair queen of my delight, and with her murdering eyes. And we have two Lauras in the group, and they all have, they have murdering eyes, believe me. Thank you. 
get an early piece with i. Now we have the latest piece on the program. Courtney masking hairs by a man named John Addison. He was a professional wind player. He played cornetto and he played recorder. He was employed uh, by Duke Charles in France many years. Came to England, he published this collection of dances. Maybe he wrote them, maybe he did, but he certainly played them. The two pieces we're going to do, um, we're going to do them back to back, were actually designated in the collection as being for cornets and sackbuts. As you can see from your program, this is a 100% sackbut free concert, this is, uh, <laughs> certified by the American Sackbut Society. Um, so we're not doing it on cornets and sackbuts. And it's interesting to me because it's not in a good range for cornets. It's, uh, it sounds not so good. So he must have been a really good player. That's all I can do. Now I need to tune up a little bit here because this has been sitting. So can I remain? especially the ones that are overwound with metal. So here we're doing just a one on a part, violins on the top two instead of the cornets, and we're using sackbuts instead of the viols. I mean viols instead of the sackbuts. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. 
there was a man named Tobias Hume. He thought, who needs a lute if you have a vial? And he went out trying to prove that anything that you could do on the lute, you could do on the vial. And it gave rise to the school of what's called Lyra Vial Playing, where you play chords, rolled chords. Of course, you can't get all six strings at once, but you can arpeggiate on them. You get all these songs that were accompanied, uh, manly songs mostly, um, including this one. It's all about the wonders of the new commodity from the Americas. <laughs> Tobacco, tobacco, sing sweetly for tobacco. Tobacco is like love, oh, love it. For you see, I will prove Love may give lean the fat man's tumor, so the It's called Thule, the period of cosmography. And I remember looking at that as a music student going, what the heck does that mean? Well, I picked this piece in part because we just discovered a body in the solar system in the Kuiper belt that's the furthest one away from the Earth. 
It's the furthest one that we know, and it's called Ultima Thule. And it's called that because in the old days, Thule was that spot at the end of the map, or off the edge of the map, where nobody ever goes because there would be monsters here. So Ultima Thule is just the far away Thule. This piece is actually referring to Iceland. Um, they called Iceland Thule, they called Greenland Thule, they called Norway Thule. And I make a big deal about this. I put the map in your program because the period of cosmography just means at the end of the map, the period being the last thing. And the first note that you'll hear, the first two notes, actually the first four notes, um, are really long notes. And it's really unusual that you would start with these really long notes. But if you look at the map, you'll see this long island in there. It looks like a musical note. It looks like a long musical note. Wilkes is intentionally making that into his music. And then it says uh, about the Vaunt of Hecla. Hecla is a famous volcano in Iceland that caused all kinds of problems back in the Middle Ages and uh, the Renaissance period. And Sulfurious Fire of Mount Etna. Tr Trinacrian. That's Latin for Sicily. So you'll see all this wordplay. Frozen climbs, the whole thing comes to a stop because they're frozen. It's called Drowning. It's a 
very, very complex piece. It's almost jazzy in certain spots. The rhythms are changing all the time. Um, it's very, very intricate. It's 20 times through a tune, a pop tune of the day called Browning. Browning, Madame, Browning, Madame, so melody we sing, Browning, Madame. You hear that in a row.
tell you now, that was the scariest piece that we've ever done. <laughs> As for a tonic from that, we're going to go to some pop songs from um, the turn of the 16th, or the 17th century, collected and arranged by Thomas Ravensbroff in the uh, preamble to it. He talks about how now everybody can enjoy these songs instead of the people who just did them on their own after he's fixed them up and things like that. So these are silly songs. They are drinking songs. They are a, a lot of fun. Tomorrow the fox will come to town. Keep, 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 keep. Tomorrow the fox will come to town. We'll keep you all at a prayer. I must desire your neighbor's all. To follow the fox out of the hall and cry as loud as you can call. Woo, 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 woo. And cry as loud as you can call. We'll keep you all at a prayer. You steal the hen out of the pen. Keep, 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 keep. keep. Who's the fool now? I see a goose ring a honk. 
This is the way that they came up with, they have people playing off of the same music at one time. Before this, they would always just have their separate part books. I have the originals, well, facsimiles of the originals back in the narthex, but you can see this is exactly what they would do. They would sit around the table, the lute player and the melody would be there, sometimes that would be the lute player, and then the alto next to the lute, the uh, bass on the end, based on the end of the tenor on the other side of the table. It's a, a pretty interesting format. So we're going to start this with some soloists, then we're going to blend the whole group into it. And after we finish that, we will have our pre-scheduled encore by next for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a hint. <laughs> I keep changing what Mary Claire has to do, so. <laughs> so the reason that she's on, on the hearts of her on this and on Rest a While, uh, who cares, so you can really hear the intricate parts um, that were written for the lute. And the lute looks great, but you can't hear it. Very much. <laughs> Oh, 